Hi, I'm John Veeman. This week on Any Place Wild, we strap on our snowshoes and make tracks in the wildest part of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Hey, we're coming in on somebody's turf here, Bill. That looks like bear scratches. This, this area is all covered with them. They get right up on their hind feet and pull the claws right down. So come along and we'll show you a cure for cabin fever. Any Place Wild is brought to you in part by Chevy Tahoe, encouraging you to find your own little part of the planet. Destination Outdoors, makers of outdoor health and safety products allowing you to experience the full enjoyment of your outdoor destination. And L.L. Bean, wherever your next adventure may take you, L.L. Bean can help you get there with a full selection of outdoor gear and apparel. This week, co-host Annie Getchell takes us snowshoeing in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. The mountains of northern New England remain one of the most heavily forested areas of the lower 48. We head for the Pemigewasset Wilderness, part of the White Mountain National Forest, which covers more area than the entire state of Rhode Island. The Pemi, as it's known, remains one of the wildest places in the east, even though it's just a day's drive from nearly half the country's population. There's no better voice of the White Mountains than grandfatherly Bill Osgood. Bill is the author of The Snowshoe Book, which has remained the definitive work on snowshoeing for a quarter century. He grew up tramping the whites. He's a lifelong woodsman who loves to share his knowledge of this forest, its past, and its creatures. 73 New England winters have hardly slowed him down at all. I think those are a fisher, don't you? Ooh. Yeah, you know those uh, animals that mm -hmm. look just like a brown house cat? Long a little tail. bit bigger, yeah, long tail. Member of the mink family. Right. Usually it looks like they only have three feet, but the reason there are only three imprints is that one of them usually hops the other, so it looks like only three feet, but oh, he actually does have four, that little critter. And he's on the search for a nice dinner. Squirrel. Somewhere. Or a porcupine. Ooh, porcupines, that'd be kind of hard to yeah, get into. Yeah, but they have a technique, and they can kill them without getting quilled. And they especially like the liver. The liver mm. is one of the most tasty parts for a porcupine. Is I, that, does that something you know from experience? Yes. <laughs> and would you like to have a porcupine liver tonight? <laughs> so we'll go out and catch us a porcupine and have it for supper. What do you say? Just and like then, a fisher. And then if the liver sticks into your teeth, then You'll you have got a perfect, perfect toothpick. toothpick. Right. <laughs> well, let's keep moving. Cha cha cha. Cha cha cha. We're traveling through dense boreal forest that closes in on all sides. Views of open country are rare in these hills, so we'll make the most of any opportunity. The deep woods have many stories to tell. Coming here with someone like Bill is the best way to bring them out. And snowshoes are the perfect vehicle here. Anyone who can walk can snowshoe and enjoy the chance to connect with the elements, simply and silently. Bill! <laughs> I think I need to give this sled a name. I was thinking tag. Tag along. Yeah, yeah. tag. Tag for sure. Tag the toboggan. His full name is Tag Along. Bill says snowshoes rival the wheel as one of man's oldest tools. About 6,000 years ago, Aboriginal hunters in Siberia fashioned board-like shoes to let them float across the snow. 
Some of the Siberian hunters headed west across the open steppes to gradually populate Scandinavia, where they developed the ski. Others migrated east, across the Bering Land Bridge, fashioning light wood and moose hide snowshoes perfect for surviving the frozen forests of North America. So you probably have lots of different kinds of snowshoes. Yeah, I think I have 14 pairs. 14. All different styles? Yeah, and... I have one for the Ojibwa style with the pointed toe. And I have uh, these Sherpas and tub snowshoes. I think the ones I use the most are these Sherpas. It's kind of a workhorse snowshoe, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yep. Traditional snowshoe types have evolved to suit different terrain. Fat, bare paw shoes work best to bash through thick underbrush. Medium-sized Maine or Michigan models excel in open woodlands of the northern forest. Long, narrow Alaska shoes are ideal for straight-line travel over wide-open terrain. The distinctive Ojibwa shoes with their upturned tip are bred for the deep powder snow of central Canada. But Bill prefers the modern metal frame type with solid decking. He calls these his working shoes. You got me? Yep. Thanks. Bill rigs a stern line on my toboggan to keep it from sliding sideways off the trail and running me over on the downhills. Do you remember the first time you came here? Yes, it was in 1949, and I was, uh, came up here with my new bride. 50 years it ago? Was, uh, we um, wow. went down to Thoreau Falls, which is not too far from here. Had a nice bivouac down there and went swimming. Delicious August weather. What a grand trip that was. You got a hold of my tail? Yeah, I'm got a hold here. You got a toboggan by the tail, you better look out. This looks a little bit tricky here. Let's see, what do you think about right that here? That good to me, Bill. Is that okay, let me go first. All right. Okay, we made that one. After a long haul stomping through the snow, it's time to find a home for the night. This is feeling good. Yeah, isn't that a kind of a perfect sight here? Right in front of this spruce tree, nice and flat. I bet there's water over there too. Beautiful. The sled there, and you say it's nine by nine? She's nine by nine. Do you want to unload the sled? I do. And I'll make a nice spot for the camp. Nine by nine. Yeah. This seems nine like sort of an ancient ritual, though, that I would like to participate in. All right. We'll do it. <laughs> We bury dead branches in the snow to make secure guy line anchors for our canvas wall tent. One more. It is hot, but not too hot. Mm. Here we come. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ooh, listen to the birch husks. <laughs> 
the paper rattling. Yeah, fluttering and... Fluttery like birches ribbing. are my favorite tree, and these are about 100 years old. However, these trees are actually second growth, a sure sign that the original spruce and pine forest is missing. Hey, we're coming in on somebody's turf here, Bill. Check it out. That looks like bear scratches. This, this area is all covered with them. <sighs> Look at this, you can literally, you can yeah. see each claw mark there. That's what they do to mark that territory. That bear says, this is my land, you keep out. So they would sort of go along yeah. and make their boundaries. And you can see other trees here. This is like a corner of their property. That's a nice display. One of the best I've seen. They get right up on their hind feet and pull the claws right down. And you can see they sometimes pull them off to the side a little bit. So, so somebody's sleeping around here. Yeah, I think mama, <laughs> mama bear and her cubs are here somewhere under the snow. But About they're getting look. restless now. They'll be getting up soon. We're headed for a nearby Appalachian Mountain Club hut, part of a system of backcountry lodges sprinkled all through the whites. We me? don't have a gotcha. reservation for the night, but we'll stop in for a cup of hot chocolate and check up on some local history. Bill is fascinated by some books that tell about the logging history of the White Mountains, but I find his personal history even more interesting. What you got? Oh, look at this. A marvelous book about the logging railroads of the White Mountains. Ooh, a little stash of personal history, Bill. Wow. Look at you. Yeah, those are some pictures from uh, my youth. <gasps> OK, this was extreme yeah, youth. That's extreme youth. Your first snowshoe that, that, excursion. That's 70 years ago. Look, you have your little uh, voyageur sash yeah. on. Censure fleche. Yes. Ready to go. Those weren't my snowshoes. I imagine those were my mother's. Can They're as get... big as you. No, they wouldn't fit me. A little bit too big, but by the time I was five years old, I had my own snowshoes. My grandson has them. Of course, he's outgrown them, but when he has children, they'll be ready to go again. So did your children and their kids learn mm. to snowshoe on yeah, the same? Yeah, on the same pair. And those snowshoes are real works of art. I imagine that they were made in New Hampshire because that's where I grew up. Gosh, and look at this. This actually was taken on Cannon Mountain, but in the background would be Mount Lafayette. And on the other side of that would be the Pemigewasset Wilderness. But I was 13 years old, and that's when I first You're started. You're 13 in that picture? Yeah. <gasps> and this is when you found the mountains. That's when I first started serious climbing up here. You know what? You don't look any different. <laughs> Then he tells me about a notorious environmental villain. Ha! There he is. J.E. Henry himself. Oh, no, he was the timber baron, the landowner around here. He Henry. was. He was one of the greatest in making money. That was his object. Didn't they call him the wood butcher? That's one of his nicknames. He had <laughs> many others. Not a, many very complimentary either. There he is on his little car. He used to love to go up and visit the logging camps, make sure his men were working hard. And if they weren't working hard, he'd find them. He'd find them? Find them. Make them pay yeah, him? Dock, it, dock their pay. <laughs> and he had this uh, list of rules, 47 rules, that he posted in all the logging camps. And if they didn't follow his rules to the T, they had fines for each one that they missed out on. Especially he was interested in that they would take good care of the horses because he cared a lot about the horses. He said, the horses are what make my money. Hmm. Horses worth $200, I can get any more men that I need. He cared more about the horses than the people. That's it. And out the window there, you can see where those logging railroads went. You see where those landslides come down? Yeah. And near the bottom, there's a white line that goes on the contour. That, that's the old railroad right down there. Chocolate in pockets. Holes in hand, and off we go for another day in the Pemigewasset wilderness. Beautiful weather. Isn't it? Wonderful, clearing up.
We ditch Tag the toboggan at the hut and venture out on a day trip to look for signs of J.E. Henry's wood butchery, still visible beneath the snow. That's completely icy there. Yeah. Watch it. Another thing. <laughs> Ooh. Here I come. Oh, no. <laughs> Watch out for me! <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> Lead on. Ah, here's the bottom. I love the wind in these big trees. Hop, two, three, four. Hop, two, three, four. <laughs> Hop, two, three, four. And we're on the Appalachian Trail now. This is the trail that goes from Maine to Georgia. And this is the northern edge of the Pemigewasset Wilderness. Pemigewasset Wilderness over there and civilization over there. I don't want to go to civilization. Let's go to the Pemi. All right. This is quite an inclined plane here, isn't it? This part of the trail is tough going. With every step, I feel like I'm going to pitch headlong down the mountain. Whoop! It's got quite a side hill. Oh, this side hill is awful. You know, I hate this trail, Annie. You hate this trail? Oh, every step you take, it's off to the side like this. <clears throat> and it's almost as though that up there on the hillside, there are giants and devils that are throwing these big stones down at us. And I think it's a payback from what uh, J.E. Henry did here, the wood butcher, because what he did was he pushed a railroad through here where ne no railroad should ever have gone just to make himself rich. And Mother Nature remembers these things. It's like a curse is on this place. And this trail to me is a real bummer. And the reason is J.E. Henry. I spit on this trail. <laughs> The wood butchers' logging crews and railroads were so ruthlessly efficient that they cleaned out the entire Pemigewasset area in less than 30 years. Most of the cutting was done in the wintertime. Wherever the trees were big enough, they built the roads up there, and then they would cut the trees and load them on sleds and bring them down by teams of horses to where the railroads were. And they always followed the contour of the land to make sure that the roads weren't too steep because when they came down the road, the horses had to hold these big loads back. As they chopped the trees out of one valley, they'd just push into the next, then the next and the next. At Henry's sawmill, huge logs were piled in seemingly endless rows that held a million board feet apiece. At the peak of this harvest, they sawed enough wood every year to build 65,000 two-bedroom homes. It's amazing, a hundred years ago, this would have just been completely empty of yeah. trees and even animals and stuff. Well, when, when they, before they came, the, the trees were huge, big trees like this. Really? I mean, spruce trees that would go a hundred feet into the air. And when he came here to log the first time, he said, uh, cut everything over 10 inches, just leave the rest. And then they did that. They cut everything over 10 inches. And then the fire came, and, and it burned all these trees that were left. And he said, I'd never do it again, because now, from now on, I cut everything. Wow. And that's what he did. He cut everything, even the uh, small trees that they couldn't use. And they just piled them up on the mountainsides and then rolled the big ones down over the top of them. Wood-burning locomotives would throw out lots of sparks. And if it happened to be dry weather, boy, that was bad news because those sparks would fly out and land in some of those um, piles of slash that were 
dried out and poof. The first great fire was in 1886, devastating this entire valley. The fires continued for years, threatening the surrounding towns and the budding White Mountain tourist industry. Something had to be done. Now you can really see the works of this disaster. All those rocks down there mm. and where they came off the cliff up there. There was nothing left to hold well, the, the rocks. rocks. Mm. And it's such a steep slope, whew, down they came. And now we have to suffer the consequences of J.E. Henry, <laughs> that well. wood butcher. Of course, old J.E. wasn't the only logger who overdid it, but his successes were the spark, literally, that led Congress to pass the Weeks Act in 1911, which established and protected national forests all over the East. This is what we come for, to see sights like this. And that blue sky up there, this is spectacular. Next, we set out to climb Zeeland Mountain for a good look at the whole expanse of the Penny Wilderness. It's a pretty tough two-hour climb up a very steep trail. Bill laughs at what he calls my enthusiastic pace and keeps to his own rhythm. But it's no hardship for me to slow down on this beautiful climb through fragrant woods. Just a few butterscotch drops later, we finally reach Scrubby Spruce near the windswept summit. Here's a trail junction. And uh, say, do you think this would be a great spot to unveil that Centure Fleche? Oh, I, well, I can't think of a better site. Let's do it. Isn't that what the voyageurs used to wear? That's right. The voyageurs wore these on ceremonial occasions. And I can't think of a more ceremonial occasion than to unveil it than here on top of this mountain. If you'd give me a hand here. There. Here you go. There. Hey, nice. And uh, my daughter made this. And the wool it's was beautiful. provided by a good friend. And so I'm really proud of it. So let's go. Oh, it's so pretty here. Woo! The view is coming up. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Whoa. Woo. This is this is Raven Country. Clap your arms. Yeah. Ah, what a day to be up here. Ah, this is the whole wilderness unfolded before us. This is marvelous. And Mount there he Washington, is. the big one. Big guy. It was hard work getting up here but I'm glad you dragged me up here uh -huh. all the way. And think we were down there yesterday. Now we're up here. You were down there cursing old J.E. Cursing J. E. old J.E. Well, you know, it was J.E. that made this wilderness possible because he, his excesses made people so angry that they went to the Congress and they said, we need to preserve this. Now it is all preserved out here, the Pemigewasset Wilderness, 45,000 acres of it, and we can see it all from here from one Tender. side to the other. Oh, look Look at this wonderful scene around us and the beautiful weather, the sun, the blue sky. It's grand. Thanks for bringing me. Oh! <laughs> to learn more about Any Place Wild and the Great Outdoors, check out PBS online at www.pbs.org.
Any Place Wild is brought to you in part by Chevy Tahoe, encouraging you to find your own little part of the planet. Destination Outdoors, makers of outdoor health and safety products allowing you to experience the full enjoyment of your outdoor destination. And L.L. Bean, wherever your next adventure may take you, L.L. Bean can help you get there with a full selection of outdoor gear and apparel. This is PBS.